vlog style video here is I have to do a bit of business. Um, first off, next Let's Play is going to be on a different YouTube channel. I have started up the, I've created the Count Zero Play or Count Zero OR Plays YouTube channel. Link will be in the doobly doo. And the game will be Delit in Wonder Labyrinth, um, the planned August anime for the Anime Explorations podcast is planned to be Record of Lotus War. So that's got me in the mood for a second. Since I've beaten um, Tactics Ogre at this point, that, uh, as far as I, by at this point, I mean when I'm recording this, this is a perfect place to pick up. I will still be using the same schedule. If you are backing my Patreon, these will all be under the same Patreon account, so you don't need to subscribe to a different Patreon uh, in order to get access to that. They will also all be available up to a week in advance under the same level of benefits. So no change there. I will be re-recording, probably like shortly after I finish recording this video, my channel trailer for this channel and also for the uh, for the for the Let's Play channel. Um, so that you will be able to um, that you'll know what you'll be getting on each of those channels, long story short. However, again, if you're still back to my Patreon, they'll, you'll still get all those all the Let's Play videos in addition to everything else. So don't worry there. If you are on following my blog, if you are set up for email reminders of posts on my blog, because you want all of the stuff, not just the videos, but also my written blog posts and that sort of thing, but don't necessarily want to back the Patreon, those will also be... Uh, Let's Plays will still also be going there, and they will still be at the same schedule of Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, with my primary videos coming out on Wednesday. So that's no change there. Similarly, the breakdown on for the um, podcast episodes will remain on this channel as well. So it's also you only need to subscribe to one new channel, and that's strictly for the Let's play stuff. Just kind of trying to optimize things and that sort of thing. Algorithm nonsense. Point two. Um, quick discussion really fast on um, Worldcon, Hugo nominations, and what I will be reading through. The short answer is not to put too fine a point on it, but, well, well, this world con this you like has been a, a without again not to put to find a point on it it's kind of been a shit show uh in terms of the organization now admittedly this has been a world con that is it's got a first time con committee more or less now from my understanding and how world cons are organized Typically, you will have a whole bunch of longtime Worldcon alumni who will offer their expertise to whoever ends up running the show because they're they they've been running multiple Worldcons. So you'll and so you end up getting that degree of institutional knowledge there. Um, however, in addition to the issues with China's genocide of the Uyghur, in addition to the Chinese government arresting foreign nationals who have been critical of the Chinese government should they enter China. Um, there also has been um, the invasion of pronounced name is pronounced so it's, uh, Sergei Lukashenko, I believe his last name is pronounced, the author of the Night Watch novels, uh, who has been advocating for war crime, who advocated for war crimes in the Russian invasion of Ukraine, not just. Oh, I'm going to support the endorse the invasion, but to double down on on that by advocating by, by endorse not even just endorsing but calling for further war crimes against the civilian population of Ukraine, and there has been pushback by authors saying, "Hey," and also attendees saying, "Hey, can you like get rid of this guy? Uh, can you like not? In, can you take?" retract his guest of honor invite and get somebody else. And the response from the, well, from the, the 
Chengdu Worldcon has been more or less silence, which is not great. And then again, on top of all of that, just the whole un announcement process for the Hugo Awards has been a mess. I went and did some digging, and like normally, by the time you've, you've gotten these announcements um, of the nominees, that's usually happened in April. And so if you have voting opening in September, actually also normally the convention itself is like in August or September, um, but instead the convention has been pushed back a bit further. So due to their own additional messes regarding the venue location, though that one I won't necessarily hold against them because... Sometimes crap happens with venues. The DC Worldcon had this issue as well, though not as much of a pushback. But like currently, like the dates for the Worldcon um, are like in October this year instead of like August. Because I remember when I went last year, when I went to my first Worldcon in uh, um, the Spokane one, it was very shortly after my graduation college. With that in mind, uh, so the awards are in August. The voting, I believe, is are the, the awards are going to be in October. The voting is going to open in August. One of the suggestions that was made in the comments at file seven seven zero, um, he, well, not in the comments, but at one by one of the science fiction writers, just put in file seven seven zero's uh, pixel scroll, was the suggestion that. You know, maybe the World Con, or maybe the the World Science Fiction Society, who who owns the trademark for the Hugo Awards, that they should separate the organization and running of the Hugo Awards themselves from the World Con selection process. Now, the implication here that was made was in the context of also having basically a moral hazard clause um, as part of this, where if you're attending the Worldcon, you still get to register to vote and that sort of thing because you're buying a membership of the World Science Fiction Society. That's part of the whole thing. But if the, if the Worldcon is, for lack of a better term, if they are, not lack like of a better term, but for, to, to summarize, if they are, end up in a country which is engaging in an acts of genocide, if it is a situation where, due to the actions of the government of that country, a significant portion of the Worldcon attendees do not feel safe attending there, this is also clearly meant to be um, aimed at a planned Dubai bid for Worldcon, and concerns about, hey, for uh, LGBT attendees in at a Dubai convention, um, then WISFIS, just use the summer, the, the World Science Fiction Society summarized, uh, abbreviated to WISFIS, has the, should have the option to pull the Hugo Awards, the ceremony and so forth itself from Worldcon. As far as for that part goes, um, that would be interesting. Um, we're talking about a very unprecedented thing here. It's now it's maybe this is something that honestly the Wispus should have been, had the option to do well in the past, but like and and I you know what yeah like that that is valid, um, because part of the thing with the World Con selection process, as far as the future locations, is it's done by popular vote at the convention itself by convention attendees. Basically, where do I want to go for a future World Con convention? That's to a degree, that worked very well in the favor of the uh, New Zealand bid, even though that one ended up happening during lockdown, and so no one was actually able to go to New Zealand. There was certainly a degree of, oh, we want to go to New Zealand. Why, like, we all wanted to go anyway for the Hobbit and for the uh, Middle Earth tour. We might have, like, because we're, we're a whole bunch of nerds and science fiction and fantasy nerds. Also, we have a science fiction convention there. So presumably the plan was, hey, we're going to be here not just for 
the weekend of the convention, but maybe take the whole week and go see the sites. That's probably the thing with a fair number of the international con of like with the Japan World Con as well. That we've had the really one Japanese World Con we've had. As far um, that said, like having that rule hazard clause is definitely like is valuable because I don't know if for the Chengdu World Con if the Uyghur Gen I forget if the Uyghur genocide had already they, that whole thing has already started by the time the voting had begun because that was not a convention I went to. That said, like I, one that seemed valid, but two, putting the moral hazard element aside, which is us, which is a big thing to put aside. But in addition to that, even if you object to having a moral hazard clause, there is value in taking the burden of organizing the actual awards of them, the actual award processing themselves off of the con committee and let the con committee focus on running the convention. The idea being in this case that con committee can focus on the venue, um, handling hotel blocks, organizing volunteers. Um, and if, even if we take away the idea of Wisfus being able to yoink the award ceremony from that convention, having the option for where the, where the con committee organizes the award show. And then in terms of the order in which the awards are given, um, scheduling and determining the uh, master ceremonies, all that sort of thing, um, rehearsals and that sort of element, and then letting Wisfis handle, okay, we have the Hugo Award website, we process the nomination um, ballots, we generate the final ballot, we work with publishers and so on to put together the nominee packet to send out to readers um, or to, not to members for consideration when it comes to the final ballot, and then finally processing those ballots and determining who the winners are and getting that to the con committee for the awards ceremony. That sort of thing. Like, that is, like, organizing an award and doing it every year, like, like that process is a lot of work anyway. Organizing a convention from everyone I've known who's organized a convention on its own is a lot of work. It is like the convention itself is a full-time job during the convention. And then for the con committee leading up to it, it is also practically a full-time job. God knows how people do this for a volunteer as a volunteer thing. And while also holding down a full-time job, I suspect there's a certain degree why a lot of the people who you end up seeing on con committees tend to be kind of older is because they're retired and have the time to dedicate to running a convention as a full or a convention bid as a full-time job. Woo. Um, so there's that. And so taking, so putting again, putting all the moral hazard elements, not taking it off the table, but setting it aside for a moment. Even if you do not have to worry about that, even if your con, even if your location is perfect and the guests of honor are ideal and, and nobody is done anything crappy, there is, and we're not worrying about canceling the convention or um, people or guests of honor choosing to withdraw withdraw from nomination because the country in question is engaging in an act of genocide or because it has guests of honor who are scumbags or anything like that. Even if you remove all of that and everything there is perfect, having somebody else with experience and knowledge and like institutional knowledge handling the actual awards them process as far as like the actual award voting ballot thing on the back end has to take a big burden off the shoulders of the con committee. 
So that feels like a like a good thing. Now, admittedly, some con committees may say, no, no, we enjoy doing this part as well, but I think it would be benefit everyone to have this degree of separation. Now, there again, will certainly be some overlap because some people from WISFIS will also be involved with con organization. That's actually good too because it's good to have that um, intersection there and the, the chain of communication, particularly when it comes time to actually doing the awards and have that avenue there for, okay, here are the envelopes with the winners in them and that sort of thing. So that is my thoughts there. And related to this, as far as for what Hugo with Omnis will be reading, I won't have a lot of time to read a bunch of these because of how the short notice is. Um, two of the nominees are books that I have already read and reviewed on this channel, specifically Legends and Lattes and Nettle and Bone. Now, the rest, Known of the Ninth is part of the uh, Sealed Tomb, I believe it's the title, uh, series which I haven't read any of yet. It is on my to-read list, but nonetheless, no, so no slight against Tamsin Mir, but that is one I won't be reading yet. That still leaves the Kaiju Preservation Society, The Daughter of Dr. Moreau, and The Spare Man um, by, respectively, uh, Sylvia Moreno-Garcia, John Scalzi, and Mary Robinette Cole. So I do intend to try and find a chance to read those at some point. I don't know if I'll get to them in before the actual awards are put forward. I'm also going to see if I can get an opportunity to get to uh, some of the best novelette and best short story stuff. Otherwise, of other nominees, like there are some good nominees here, um, like straight up. Uh, I especially, like of these, I always like to look at the best related work category, and there's a book here called Chinese Science Fiction Oral History Volume 1 by Yang Feng, and I don't know if this book has an English translation, but if it does, I want to read it. If this is only available in, in Chinese, that would be a bummer. Because that's a book I like. I love reading the history of stuff like this. And so I really hope that I'd get a chance to read this. Uh, at some point in the future. Um, apparently, all, there's going to be a three-volume series. All three books are supposed to be out before the Chengdu Science Fiction Convention, which fits with, like, apparently, the venue is supposed to be the Chinese Science Fiction Museum, which, again, if you remove the context of, you know, the Uyghur genocide, this would be great. I do have reservations over whether the content in the museum may be culture washed a bit to remove some science fiction authors who the Chinese government, in particular the current um, regime, might deem problematic because of being critical to the government in the past, of past governments, but still. Anyway. Like that, like that is a book I would have been interested in reading. Um, other than that, um, the final point I want to talk about real quick is there was a very interesting um, study that was done by the Union History Foundation, who I have talked about in the past as being a organization worthy of your time and your support when it comes to, well, the preservation of video game and video game history. I have advocated repeatedly that, hey, if there is a, if you have access to a prototype or development notes of a game that has not been released, which I've talked about, but, but which has been covered in Nintendo Power Magazine, when, I've, when that's comes up, I have, my repeated advocacy is get in touch with the Video Game History Foundation, get that to them, so that can be preserved and made available to researchers. And one of the pieces that the, speaking of researchers, one of the things that the Video Game History Foundation has done recently is a study about the commercial availability of video games. We're not talking about piracy here. Um, well, we, we are talking somewhat about piracy, but the focus here is on the what 
games has the industry deemed worthy of making available in conjunction with the total population of video games. And I bring this up because, well, their period of historical games they're referring to are games prior to, 20, to 2010, which fits us right in where we're at with Nintendo Power Magazine. And indeed, one of the platforms that they are covering for the survey is the Game Boy, which is one of the systems that we are dealing with over the course of this. And they put a kind of focus on three main platforms. Um, of those, the one that most is most relevant to Nintendo Power Perspectives is the Game Boy family. Not just the Game Boy itself, but the POC but the Game Boy Color and the Game Boy Advance. And the that system is well, that sort of family of systems is one that they've determined as being neglected. What does neglected mean? Neglected means that there is an interest commercially and from a research standpoint that from developers and researchers and enthusiasts, which I'm two of those. I'm a researcher and an, and an enthusiast, and I'm certain a fair number of people on this channel or who follow channels that I follow or do channels that I follow um, fit in the other aspects of the category, but there is very little activity in terms of stuff available or the, avail the works that are available have gone down. The example, for example, they give is there have been in the not too distant future or not too distant past, rather, I should say, um, been a fair number of Game Boy games available, um, both physically and um, digitally, through the um, not just the Switch and through like Switch and through compilation packs like the Castlevania Mobile Collection, not mobile, but the Portable Collection that Konami put out, or the re-releases of some of games in the um, Shantae series, but also in terms of things like the Virtual Console on the Wii U and 3DS. And so, if you include all of that, you have a... Uh, you still have 87.7 of the Game Boy's library that is just, you can't get. Some of that's because of licenses. Um, like, Total Recall for the Game Boy is probably a game that not many people and so there's low, um, so that's unlikely to get rescued necessarily, but on and re-released. But on the other hand, and um, like one of the games that I'm going to be covering in an upcoming issue, um, in the issue of Nintendo Power Retrospectives that will be going up, uh, to, not tomorrow, but next week is a puzzle game that is not licensed and is fully owned by the company that published it. I'm not going to give too much away in advance, but that game, theoretically, should just be able to be put out. But it's not available. And I, I've already checked, like, on my own, like, it's not available f digitally. It's not available. And, like, you can get it physically, uh, through eBay and other places, but it's not readily available in re-release. And if then the game in question, it's called The Fidgets. It is a puzzle platformer with a co-op um, element, not in terms of like multiplayer necessarily, but in terms of having of shifting control between two characters, each with different abilities. It's you know, it, it is the kind of thing that actually would be really good for like. If you're researching this type of game and you're trying to do like a, a retro clon, this would be something that you want to, might very much want to take a look at from a design research standpoint. But that's not available at all. And then on top of that, the Wii U and 3DS eShops are no longer available for you to purchase anything from. So anything on those virtual consoles could have bought before is off the table. So actually... Um, the situation is even more dire than it was before. Is technically now the available number of games that are available is only 5.9 percent, which basically puts us at about 96.1 percent availability with like a two percent margin of error. Which still, that's 
basically 90%, 90-89% of the Game Boy family overall that you just can't get legally. Now, illegally, over piracy, you can probably get a lot of this because people have dumped all or most of the ROMs and there's plenty of enthusiast-based emulators that you can play. And now, because of legal precedents, those emulators are safe. Thanks to court decisions related to Bleem and other such software, you can just, like, those emulators aren't going away. However, as we've seen through legal actions by Nintendo, so I'm focusing on the Game Boy family here, not talking about the Commodore 64, which is one, which is one of their systems they researched, or the PlayStation 2, is when we're talking about Nintendo here, they are also particularly litigious when it comes to going after these ROM hosting websites and trying to get them shut down, which means that the preservation of these games through these through hosting of emulation uh, of ROM sites is fragile. Because even now, certainly, ROM sites can be very whack-a-mole. One site goes down, three more go up, but there's always that risk of Whoever pits up this other site, did they have a complete scrape of everything before from this, from this other site when they left? There's always that risk of just something somewhere getting dropped. That at some point somebody goes, like somebody forgets about, about the fidgets and it gets left behind somewhere. And, or, and by left behind, I mean it doesn't get, didn't get scraped or the person hosting the next site didn't upload it. And the person and some of the people who have it don't think to go, oh, hey, you're missing the fidgets. I have a ROM for that. Let me send that to you. So now it's all likely that people will remember the fidgets at some point and go to go check it, because, go to make sure to get it because it was featured in Nintendo Power Magazine. But how many games didn't? Um, how many miracle piano teaching systems or planner softwares or whatever didn't get dumped or didn't get think to get hosted on another site because oh that's eh, not that interesting anyway where I, like honestly for me i'm not covering it because i'm focusing on games as opposed to utility software but from a historical research standpoint it is interesting to take it's the kind of thing where you want to go where like, somebody like the game historian might go i want to take a look at this software I want to take a look at the productivity software that people put out for the Game Boy or other handheld systems and not just it's not just see how it looks and works on this system but also hey how what does it, does it work well on the game what happens if you put it in a Game Boy Color what happens if you put it in the Game Boy Advance what happens if you put it in the uh in one of the Uh, more re recent retro clone systems that will handle that and use um, the FPGA to replicate the, the processing hardware and architecture of the system, that sort of thing. That sort of stuff. So, from a preservation standpoint, that's a big deal. The way things are currently now is if you are wants to archive these games like you can circumvent drm to preserve them and back them up and that sort of thing but there is no legal way to put them online and for people to digitally check them out and play them that way so consequently for example for nintendo power retrospectives i am frequently working in violation of the law from a copyright standpoint i am strictly because from as far as game capture goes it's incredibly expensive to have to get every N64 game. Uh, it's also from a sheer logistical standpoint, it's also a pain in the butt to have to, if I did have every fit, um, N64 game, or even had people loaning them to me to be swapping out the different cartridges and memory cards, that's why I use a uh, flash card, is because that way I can after I finish going through a particular game, I can hit and capture footage for it, 
I can hit reset, it takes me back to the menu, and I can just go down to the next one and start capturing footage again from there. What I'd like it to be is have this all be above board and on the up and up. So to have the option where something like organization like the Strong Museum of Play will let you go, hey, if a we have a web platform or archive.org for that matter, have a web platform that you can use to check out a game and play it and will let me do game capture for uh, let me or other people do game capture of this as well whether it's using a screen capture software or something else um and and experience the game through a browser ideally also with having other elements of the ephemera available with it as a sort of like museum presentation sense where like a scan of the manual is available a scan of the box that sort of thing all of that and then that would let me just go through, play these games, capture the footage I need fully legally. It wouldn't necessarily be on original hardware, but there is less of a legal issue on um, related to this. So that's where we're at. And hopefully when it comes time for the next wave of looking for exceptions to the DMCA for the sake of preservation, archival, and research, that this study, which I will link to, link to the, the announcement, the explainer, and the study itself in the doobly-doo, that hopefully this will be the thing that opens up game preservation to a way where emulation of full game libraries doesn't have to be the kind of thing that basically operates in the back alleys of the internet. We'll see. Fingers crossed. So that's where we're at for announcements and news articles. Next week, I will be returning to Nintendo Power Retrospectives again. This was a big enough news story that I felt it was, and a big enough thing to talk about that it was worth pushing Nintendo Power Retrospectives back to focus on this and in the process also talk about the future plans for covering the Hugo Awards this year because I you know, normally try to do that and more than that um, general channel business. We will return to our regular scheduled stuff more or less next month. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.